Hey, today we're talking about episodes 33 through 36 of Rui's Royal Love. The Emperor has been a bit cold to the Empress after Hui's deathbed confession, and she definitely takes notice. It's so hard to reconcile this scared, timid thing with the person who ruins lives without blinking an eye. I'm starting to think she has some kind of split personality disorder. The Emperor contracts scabies from that gross cushion Hui set up for him. It's contagious and Rui gets it too. The Empress decides to take care of him herself and earn some brownie points. No one, not even Rui, is allowed in, even though she already had scabies. I am living for Rui's sarcasm. The Empress is clearly just using this as an excuse to be the only one who sees him. While the other women despair about not being able to take care of the Emperor and show off their love, Shu actually does something, going out and hanging banners in the rain to pray for his health. I have really been loving her entry into the harem. She has zero patience for chit chat, and her expression while the women are talking in circles really cracks me up. She really matches well with Rui. But her dedication still isn't enough to move the Empress, who is bent on being the only one taking care of him. We all know what you're doing, lady. When the Emperor wakes up, he is a bit standoffish at first, but after a bit of crying, he finally relents and takes her back. I mean, waking up to someone who's been tending to you day and night, it's a bit hard to stay uncaring, and it would look bad. But then, that was the whole reason she did this. Not long after, the Emperor recovers and the Empress gets pregnant. Chun is already several months pregnant with her third child at this point, and Jia is feeling the pressure as she only has her one son. Things start moving really fast now. You can imagine how seriously the Empress is taking the pregnancy. Things are locked down tight, only her most trusted servants are allowed to look after her. She's under a lot of pressure. Jia renews her efforts with the Emperor in hopes of getting a second son. By the way, this dance reminds me of the drama Huang Jinyi, which I really recommend if you're looking to get into Korean historical dramas. It's really good. Shun gives birth to a princess, so she has the third and sixth princes and now the fourth princess, not to mention the adopted first prince, just rolling in children. Then Jia gets pregnant. Months later, the empress goes into labor early. She successfully gives birth to the seventh prince. He's weak and fussy, but he's here. Finally, the empress is getting all the love and attention she's been striving for for years. Then, all of a sudden, fifth prince is five? We're just sprinting forward. Rui and Hailan are raising him as a team, and they seem to be doing a great job. The Emperor has already decided to make Seventh Prince the Crown Prince, despite his poor health. Doctors warn the Empress that she needs to be very careful raising the Seventh Prince, as he could very easily catch a cold and die. The doctors have also made it clear that the Empress has about as much chance of getting pregnant as the Emperor does, so as weak as he is, he's all she has. Since the Emperor and Rui are back to being lovebirds, he puts Rui in charge of harem matters so the Empress can focus on taking care of their son. With another time skip, we cut to a stormy day. Jia is in labor and it is taking a while. The Empress is so worried about her own kid though that she won't spare a moment for her. Ouch. Poor Jia needs some royal support to get through this delivery, and since the Empress isn't interested, they send Yan Wan or Ying Er to ask the Emperor to come and see her. Yen Wan delivers her message, and one of the eunuchs seems to take a sudden interest in her. He walks her back and makes it clear that he can make her life easier if she does him some favors. Yen Wan is being tortured daily at Jia's palace, and she's so desperate that she accepts. In the end, no one goes to see her, and Jia gives birth to the eighth prince alone. Despite the difficult delivery and this being her second son, the emperor is still 100% focused on the empress's son, which obviously pisses Jia off. So she turns to her favorite stress relief, making Yan Wan's life hell. But now Yan Wan is working with that creepy eunuch, so with the light at the end of the tunnel, she can power through. Sometime later, Yan Wan is finally able to make her move. When the Emperor runs into Jia and Rui in a garden, she accidentally lets out a sigh of pain. I... Creepy eunuch draws attention to her and the Emperor takes notice. He calls her over and it isn't long before he notices all the bruises on her body. He is not amused. And Jia really has no excuse for being such a b <coughs> Especially since Yan Wan makes sure to mention her new name, Ying Er. The Emperor decides Yan Wan should be removed from Zhao's palace. He suggests taking her in as one of his mates. Rui steps in and suggests marriage. Perhaps she has a certain guard in mind? Oh, Yan Wan. 
Now she's been handed a perfect out. If she really loves Yoon Cha, then this is the perfect opportunity to get married since he's now higher ranked and has the support of Ri. There's nothing holding them back from being together, so if she chooses to serve the Emperor, obviously she never really wanted to marry Yoon Cha and was just using his love for her as a way to manipulate him. Nubi. I do still understand Yen Wan. I just don't like her. As Ruyi heads back home, she is of course thinking of poor lovestruck Yoon Cha. He really should have taken the hint after the first time, but I get it, love. It's clear that Yen Wan came with a goal in mind. She immediately gets to work seducing the Emperor, although I use the word seducing very lightly because the Emperor is so easy. So in literally no time, we get way dying second class female attendants. Creepy eunuch Jin Jong is happy to have her as a tool and intends to help her climb all the way to the top. And it makes sense, after all, we've seen the symbiotic relationship between eunuchs and harem women play out so many times. Also, since he is the one who got her here, she can't just say, okay, bye. Yin Wan's first night serving the emperor, she runs into Yun Cha on the streets. He asks her if she was forced, if she was lying before, what any of this meant. She admits that marrying him was simply a way out of hardship and this way gives her more. She's not cruel about it, but there's no way to say this and leave Yun Cha feeling good about himself, right? I do think Yen Wan's speech is really good, though. Yun Cha gets his bearings and, addressing her formally, wishes her the best. I have to say, he handled this really well. Later that night, Rui finds Yun Cha moping on the stairs, having just said goodbye to the Yen Wan he knew. She sits by him, teasing him not to drown himself in liquor like he did last time. I just love that she's so casual with him and actually sees him as a friend. She tells him to forget about Yen Wan and plan for his own future. She promises to help however she can. Since Yun Cha serves the Emperor directly, he spends the following months having to listen to them from the outside. He doesn't drink himself to death, but I sure would have. <laughs> <laughs> Yen Wan eventually gets promoted to first class female attendant. Jia really was pushing her luck keeping Yen Wan around for this long. It was only a matter of time before someone brought it to the emperor's attention. Also, after literally years of abuse from Jia, Yen Wan's motivations are not crazy at all. She actually used to be from a highly ranked family and only became a maid because her father was punished which brought down her family status. But even if she had never tasted a privileged life, I can understand not wanting to spend the rest of your days as lower class. What makes me dislike her is the way she uses and drops Yun Cha, knowing damn well that he is in love with you, giving you money, asking favors so that you can one day get married. You were more than happy to pretend that that's what you wanted too, when it suited you, only to drop him like a hot potato the moment you get the chance. There's nothing wrong with wanting more for yourself, or as she says, relying on herself, but this kind of disregard for other people is what outs her as a shitty person, though it's still surprising to see how bad she gets. And now for a look at the book. Novel Yen Wan is more proactive and I actually love her for it. She's the one who approached Jin Zhong with this plan, so rather than going along with him, it's more like she was sick to death of this life and decided to do something about it. She even says she planned on killing herself if it didn't work. I like it because it makes her more of a strong woman pushed to the edge instead of a weak-willed girl going along with whoever gives her the best offer. Even at the staircase meeting with Yun Cha, she makes no apologies, there are no tears, it simply is what it is. They made a bunch of small changes that make drama Yen Wan look a lot more pitiful than I think she was meant to. In the drama, the servants get nervous that they've been talking too long and call her over. She's crying and Yun Cha takes that first step to put a wall between them by addressing her formally. In the book, it's not like that. Yen Wan is finished talking to him, she calls her maids over, and she is the one to set up that boundary between them, saying rather coldly, Ling Shi Wei, ni ke yi tui xia le. Guard Ling, you may go. Even though she made the same choice, I much more respect this calm and collected version of Yen Wan. Don't break Yuncha's heart and then cry about it like you're the victim. <sighs> Till next time, thanks for watching.